So anyway, welcome and good afternoon. Um, my name is Miriam Batista. I work in the Office of Development and Alumni Affairs. It's wonderful to see so many parents here joining us um, for the Learning Commons session, where you're going to learn about the various ways that Quinnipiac can support your student in their academic journey. Um, so we will begin with John Guthrich. He will start. He is the Director of Academic Development and Outreach. In addition to John, you'll also hear today from Matt Cooper, who is the Director of Office, Director of the Office of Student Accessibility, Tracy Halstead, who is the Manager of Peer Academic Support, and Katie Landry, who is an academic coach. So thank you again for joining us, and please join me in welcoming Matt, John, Katie, and Tracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to definitely a different version of this parent session. Um, in years past, for years now, we've been having you over. Um, all of us have had our cookie contest going on where you get to be the judges. The students bring you in so we can finally meet the families they always tell us about. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to walk through kind of an update of here's what's been going on in the Learning Commons. All right, Katie. We Katie, give me a verify. You can see my screen now. Awesome. Yes, we can. Perfect. So um, for many of you, the last time I, you got to see my lovely face was at either a former parent meeting or at uh, orientation um, up in TD Bank this past summer. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk through. I'm going to introduce you to our panel, just some of the folks that have come from the office today. To, to talk to you about the different programs that are going on in the Learning Commons. We'll give you some highlights of, here's some big things that have been happening since the um, semester has started, along with some updates that are coming up, things to expect coming up in the, the rest of the fall and as we transition um, into the spring semester. And then we are going to do some structured questions where we wanna make sure that we get some information to our families at large of like, here are some things to be thinking of as we go on some advice from our panel members. So to start out with, um, talking about peer academic support, we have Tracy Halstead. Tracy, you wanna say hello? Oh. Mute myself. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Tracy Halstead and uh, I manage peer academic support programs in the Learning Commons. Um, there are three of us, I manage two programs the Peer Fellow Program and the Study Table Program. Um, I'm also speaking for my colleague Bernard Grindle today, who manage, who uh, is Assistant Director of the Learning Commons and manages, manages peer tutoring. And then uh, my colleague Rita Ofieli manages the Peer Catalyst Program. Uh, so I'll be speaking about those three programs and just differentiating them for you a little bit. Perfect. Um, talking about academic development and outreach, we have Katie Landry, one of our academic coaches. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Landry. Like John said, I am one of the academic coaches and I work specifically with our students in the School of Health Science that are in their pre-professional programs throughout their first year. Uh, so I'm super excited to talk a little bit about what our team's been up to um, and what the specialists have been up to as well. And then finally, from our Office of Student Accessibility, we have Matt Cooper, our director. Hello, everyone. This is Matthew Cooper, and I am the director of the Office of Student Accessibility, OSA. Uh, we are located in the Learning Commons, and I look forward to sharing our numbers and what our um, what our goals are in the immediate future and the in the long term future. Uh, well, that being said, let's dive right in. And the first thing we're going to talk about, um, Katie, why don't you lead us through and give some updates of what's going on in academic development world? Absolutely. So for those of you that attended orientation over the summer, I'm sure you have heard us say that we think of the Learning Commons um, as the place you go when you want to perform at a level higher academically than you could on your own. And so that's really the root of our work. We remind our students regularly we are the academic gym, not the academic mechanic. And so we really encourage them to use all the services we're going to talk about today regularly so that they can get the most out of them. So I'm gonna start by talking a little bit about our academic coaches and what the work we do is and what we've been doing so far this year. So our academic coaches connect with first year students starting in the summer before they even get to Quinnipiac. So for my first year parents who are on this call, I'm sure you remember us reaching out to your students over the summer, uh, sending them a couple of emails, maybe even some phone calls. 
And so we continue to reach out over the course of the first year throughout the year. So actually our most recent outreach um, over the course of this past week, we're at mid-semester. So we were doing our mid-semester check-in, just reaching out and seeing how everything's going, checking in to see what their experience is like so far and asking them to share with us what's been new, maybe what they've been enjoying, if there's anything they'd like some support on. So we've gotten some really cool feedback from that so far. And the root of our role is to help new students address Quinnipiac's academic expectations. And so throughout the course of this first year, we work with students through this developmental advising model, which is a really fun way to connect with them because we connect with them in a very unique way in comparison to some other people on campus. And so the first thing that we work with our students on is this idea of learning strategy and evidence-based learning. And so we really walk our students through now that you're in college and now that you have these different expectations, how can you learn in a way, study in a way where you're going to get the most out of this experience? Um, we regularly remind them a lot of the information they learn now is stuff they need to know and need to remember as they move on and up into these careers and even into grad school, whatever their next step is. I'm sure many of you have seen students' schedules look a lot different from high school. They continuously change, whether they get internships, go into clinical. So we sit down and talk to students about time management and organization. And so it's really critical for us to make sure that in the course of their first year, students are learning how to manage their time and create their own calendars, create their own schedules, because they tend to have a lot more free time and we wanna make sure they're using that effectively. So we have a lot of conversation about organization, time management, and another big thing we touch on is transitional concern. And so in orientation, you'll hear us say to students, we're your one-stop shop. So come to us first and we're happy to redirect you to other resources. So students that maybe are experiencing some homesickness, they may be having questions about financial aid or financial concern. We have them come to us so that we can redirect them to our friends on campus that we know can support them. What's really cool about that is we're never redirecting to offices, we're redirecting to friends. So I know Matt's going to talk about OSA later, but I can say regularly, I'll say, oh, let me introduce you to my friend Yvonne in OSA rather than here's the access email, just reach out. And so when students work with us, we're able to introduce them face to face with people, pull people into conversation. As students end their first year, they transition onto working with their academic specialist, which is a really cool consultation role. And they continue to develop the skills that was introduced to them in their first year by the academic coaches. And so the specialists really work to recontextualize evidence-based learning strategies as students dive into some of these harder classes and as students prepare to even shift from their undergraduate career and master's programs or undergraduate career into taking maybe some tests or certifications as they think about what they wanna do with their careers. They have to adjust and coaches or specialists help them adjust to the increasing demands of cognition. Um, and they talk a lot about metacognition. So helping students start to think about how are you thinking and how are you actually applying these strategies to your courses? Another really cool thing that our academic specialists do is they use their experience and they use a lot of the data collected by the learning comments to have a larger impact on campus. So they work with faculty, they work with different programs and they identify opportunities for support and development throughout campus. So, both of our teams work together, so both the coaching roles and the academic specialist roles work together to also engage in early intervention. So we do personalized outreach to students throughout the semester anytime we hear concerns. And so all of our 100 level courses, professors will let us know and typically into the higher level courses if students are absent, if they're missing assignments, um, if they experience, if they have a low grade on an exam or a project. And so we're able to do this really cool early intervention whenever professors share those concerns. Um, like I talked about a little bit earlier, we work with so many other stakeholders on campus that because we receive these early interventions, we're able to loop stakeholders in right off the bat. And so it's really awesome that we're able to talk to academic advisors and say, hey, let's connect with your academic advisor if you had an absence and something's going on, or if we need to loop other campus stakeholders in so that students can be successful and we can catch those things early and work with them and make sure we're helping students stay on track throughout the course of first year, second year and beyond. John, can you switch me to the next slide, please? Thank you. So like John said, we are gonna be giving you some up updates today. So I have a couple of really exciting updates from our academic development and outreach team. The first is that already this semester, we've had over 1300 appointments scheduled with academic coaches and specialists, which has blown us away. And we have been so excited to be working with students at this level. Um, students have been making appointments this semester through the QU mobile app as well as online through the MyQ page on our new Thrive for Students webpage. This is really cool for students. Um, I've heard a lot of positive feedback because they're able to see my whole calendar. And so rather than playing the back and forth game of, are you free this time? I know you don't have class, actually I have internship. Um, they can just see my calendar and say, oh, perfect, Katie's free tomorrow at 10 and they can grab that slot for themselves. 
And so we've actually seen this work, as you can see, by over 1,300 appointments really well for us. We've been kept on our toes, but it's been really nice connecting with them. Um, another point here is because we're using Zoom, typically those days where it's raining and a student doesn't want to walk across campus and maybe they don't come to their appointment, because we're on Zoom, we're seeing a lot more students actually attend these meetings and be able to kind of overcome some of the barriers that they might have used to experienced. Um, I know personally for me, it's been super cool using Zoom, especially when working with my international students. So I was on a call the other day with one of my students from India and we were actually able to see each other. And even though we're on crazy different time zones, it was nice to be able to sit down with her and see her during that meeting. So we've had a really awesome experience with our Thrive system so far. Another thing we've been working on is course specific metacognitive workshops. So we've been workshopping courses like biology, psychology, um, our ELMPA and our OT students that are transitioning to grad school. And really what we do here is we work with the faculty in these programs to develop workshops using the resources that are rooted in these courses. So I can talk a lot more specifically about bio because that's actually one of the workshops I've been working on. But students have a lot of awesome resources rooted into their bio textbook. Um, there are practice tests that exist. And so we walk through students, walk through with students, how do you use these resources effectively while using evidence-based learning strategies? And all of the examples we give in those workshops are specific to their courses. So for any of my parents that have students taking bio 101 or 150, you know I have told them that this weekend they better be brain dumping for photosynthesis and cellular respiration. And so we talk about how do you use these specific to the courses, specific to the exams that you're going to encounter this semester. We also have staff teaching a one credit course right now that focuses on developing learning strategies. Um, this is a really awesome seminar. It's called QU 105. And so we're running a couple sections of that right now. And what's really cool about that is it's running coinciding with the other courses they're in. And so the assignment students are doing, the conversation students are having in that course aligns directly with their other coursework. So they're not just learning about time management. They're learning time management in this semester. How can they build themselves a fall 2020 semester calendar that takes into account the other courses that they're taking? And so we have a couple students taking that. We have a couple sections that ring right now, and that's been really exciting for our coaches. Um, we ran a couple sections over the summer as well. And so that's open to not only first year students, but students in, again, sophomore, junior, senior year that want to improve those learning strategies and those learning skills. And then lastly, a really, really, really new and really exciting opportunity. Um, typically, our occupational therapy program works outside of QU as they do some of their clinicals. But this year, the OT program has actually paired up with the learning comments and has collaborated to offer groups to students who want to develop their executive functioning skills. And so we have these weekly groups running with our OT students in their master's and doctoral level program um, that are helping students with executive functioning, planning out scheduling, revisiting these concepts of learning strategies and helping them implement them day to day throughout the week, which is really, really awesome. As the university has recognized how much students are using our services and meeting with our staff, we are really excited to announce that we're actually currently searching to hire two additional team members. So we are going to be hiring a new academic coach that'll be working with our first year students. So we're so, so excited to be adding to the academic coach team. We're also gonna be hiring an academic specialist for the North Haven campus. And so they'll be working specifically with students at the North Haven campus in programs that run there. Um, we're also all gearing up right now, preparing for J-term. So we have a busier J-term than normal. We have more students taking courses. And so we're starting to get ready for that response, making sure all those services are ready to go. And again, thinking back to course-specific metacognitive workshops, we're starting to think about what services are we going to add as that J-term gets a little busier and make sure we're prepared to work with students. So we're really excited to see who we're going to be working with um, and what students will be taking J-term courses. So that's our update for now. And I believe now I'm handing it over to Tracy to talk a bit more about peer education. Thanks, Katie. All right, Tracy, there you go. Hi. Uh, so again, I'm Tracy Halstead, uh, managing peer academic support in the Learning Commons. Uh, so John, you can advance the slide. Uh, so I have two colleagues. Uh, I manage the peer fellow program and the study table program, and I'll define all of our programs for you so that you know the differences. Um, my colleague, Bernie Grindle, Bernard Grindle, is the assistant director of the Learning Commons, and he manages peer tutoring. And my colleague, Rita Ofieli, uh, manages peer academic support, uh, specifically the Peer Catalyst program. So just to let you know a little bit about our numbers, uh, we have 82 peer catalysts 
and 12 peer catalyst mentors. These, these academic mentors support first year seminar primarily and some general ed courses. Um, the 45 peer fellows that we have on staff, these are like the peer catalysts, undergraduates, uh, and 11 study table mentors who support uh, 128 STEM course sections in total. So that's uh, basically um, science, technology, engineering, and math courses, difficult gateway courses for majors. And then we also have 45 peer tutors supporting 290 different courses in basically any major that your student would be pursuing at Quinnipiac University. So the peer tutors are working in one-on-one -on -one support. Um, the qualifications are that the uh, student employee needs to have an A or A minus in the supported class, demonstrated leadership that's validated in professor recommendations and strong metacognitive skills, which really means a self-awareness as to how one's own learning works. Um, so you can advance, John. All right, so I'll be talking about the programs specifically. The first one is the Peer Catalyst Program uh, managed by Rita. And uh, basically the Peer Catalysts will attend class with the, with the students. Uh, their primary role is within the class itself. Um, most of our Peer Catalysts will be supporting first year seminars. So they attend class along with the students and they help to foster uh, intellectual uh, conversations uh, that promote uh, student success and student academic engagement. Um, this program has recently been expanded to include gen ed courses such as anthropology, uh, biology for majors, uh, history, uh, occupational therapy courses, sociology, game design, and engineering. Those particular courses will not necessarily have peer catalysts across all sections, uh, but they but but peer catalysts will work in select courses with the faculty, uh, depending on the nature of the course. If it's a, for instance, a seminar course requiring a lot of student participation, um, that's a good candidate for a peer catalyst. So there are three goals in the peer catalyst program really are increasing interactive learning opportunities, you know, so students need to learn that their own engagement and their own participation is a huge component in the quality of the class. Um, they help students to become autonomous learners so that uh, st students along the way, first year students will kind of shed this idea that education is something that happens to me from the outside, it's something that my professors kind of give me, uh, you know, but it really, uh, education has to be a two-way street, so to speak, with the student engaged in the class and adding to the quality of the class. Um, and promoting intellectual engagement might be something uh, along the lines of how you approach a textbook, you know, how you analyze a text as opposed to just summarize a text, um, how you have a a discussion that promotes critical thinking rather than just criticism, if you understand what I mean. So you can advance the slide, John, thank you so much. Um, the programs that I manage include the peer fellows and the study tables. Um, so for the peer fellows, a peer fellow is trained extensively. We have two long all day training seminars, one in the summer before classes begin, and one in January, but they also train with me every other week in biweekly appointments uh, that are either very small groups or the individual peer fellow. And so the training is a huge component of their work. And these students like our peer catalysts and our peer tutors uh, have earned an A and A minus in a traditionally difficult class. Um, that's been recommended and, and the student has been recommended by their faculty of that class. Um, the peer fellow attends all classes and takes notes with the current students. Uh, they foster student success and confidence in the supported class. Um, basically peer fellows after taking notes in the class will hold a weekly voluntary group study session and they will re 
they will uh, review the content and promote effective study methods. Uh, so here are some of our supported classes. Um, mostly we have STEM classes in that program. Um, how students can make most of their time at a peer fellow study session. So again, you know, along the lines of the student brings something to their education. Uh, we want students not to just expect a repeat of the whole lecture. That's really the professor's realm um, to lecture the students or to provide the content. So we want this, the students to review the lecture and come with at least a foundational knowledge of the topics at hand. And we would like them to come prepared to participate in the discussion. So you can advance the slide. Uh, the study table mentors, that's a little bit less formal than the peer fellow program. So for study tables, uh, students will drop in for support. Um, and uh, basically, you know, these are trained mentors. They train along with the peer fellows in case they have to run uh, like an impromptu group study session but they're available for students in select chemistry, economics, math, and physics courses. Um, at a study table, students drop in with questions that they have on class topics. Um, this, this particular work, unlike the peer fellow work, is done one-on-one -on -one, uh, in most cases, but sometimes in small groups too. Uh, so it depends if students come in from say one chemistry section, um, they all have the same professor. The study table mentor might be doing some group work with those students, um, which is why they train with the peer fellows. It's a little bit less formal than what the peer fellows offer because um, they, do not, they do not prepare activities or a worksheet, so to speak, beforehand. Um, they take students on a job in basis. Um, making the best use, to, use of students' time in a study table, we would like students visiting a study table to come prepared with questions on specific topics so that there's a focus for the visit. It's so, you know, we, we want the um, students to know their problem areas before they come into the study table. Um, so I'll done with that slide, John, thanks. Uh, and then peer tutoring, this is one-on-one -on -one support. This program is managed by Bernie Grindle. And uh, I, I believe that I said, um, oh, 290 classes um, on up. I mean, that's a ballpark figure. Uh, students across the majors at Quinnipiac University uh, can expect to be able to find a tutor in their major to help them one-on-one -on -one with specific uh, concepts, uh, tests, you know, homework problems. These peer educators, as are the peer fellows and, and PCs, are trained in concepts related to academic integrity. So, you know, really our peer educators are not giving answers for homework, but what they're doing is they're steering students in the right direction so that students can ultimately solve problems and derive answers on their own. Um, so uh, students who use this service, they usually want to improve test and exam results, understand concepts from the class, or complete an assignment. Uh, appointments are 30 minutes or an hour long. So if a student wants a running, uh, a, like a running engagement with a tutor, say uh, once a week, they can arrange for that. But generally we have um, 30 minute long appointments. Uh, by special arrangement, a student can engage a tutor, the same tutor, say like once a week, um, probably for no more than an hour though. Um, tutors have earned an A or an A minus in the course like our other peer educators, and they've been highly recommended by faculty. Uh, tutors are also trained uh, in the College Reading and Learning Association program. Um, I did forget to mention for the peer fellows, just a really quick aside, um, we had uh, 1,430 contacts, separate um, contacts with peer fellows on the part of students. And uh, that was just for Bio 101. And in Bio 101, we served 439 individual students in the peer fellow program. Um, in Bio 211, which is a sophomore anatomy class, we had 675 contacts with, uh, with peer fellows. So that's like, that's basically, um, the number of times our collection of students attended sessions. Um, 
and that program represented 245 students. So all of these programs uh, involve you know, a great volume of students and that's why our peer education programs are, are robust and you know, the staffs are quite large. Um, lastly, I just wanna talk about in the future, if your student ever wants to become a peer educator in one of our four programs, um, I strongly suggest that they attend the, uh, the sessions, you know, in the program that they're interested in. Um, if it's a peer catalyst, you know, that they engage in class and, and uh, show an interest in class discussion um, and an interest in the material, uh, as well as for all of our peer educators to be earning an A or an A minus in the supported class, the class that they're interested in, um, you know, in uh, supporting students or covering. Um, and that they, I, I believe I said, you know, attend sessions, that's important. Um, so it could be, it could possibly be that your student, if your student is earning these top grades and utilizing our peer educators could apply for one of these roles because, you know, we are one of the, we are, you know, what do I want to say? Like one of the largest um, employees of student workers. Uh, so with that said, I'll have John advance the slide to whoever's next. Looks like that's me. Uh, hello, everybody. This is Matthew Cooper. I am the director of the Office of Student Accessibility. Uh, within the office, which is located at both Learning Commons at Mount Carmel and North Haven, um, is Kate Palumbo, who's the associate director, and she typically runs these um, these meetings. But she's up in uh, she's taking her kids to some indoor water park or something. I don't know, but uh, she's the face of OSA for for good reason. No one wants to look at this every day. We also have Yvonne Sanders as well as Ali Theodore, who some of you may have already talked to. Uh, in support of your students. And the glue that holds us all together is Robin uh, D'Amato, who is our, uh, who's our uh, secretary uh, that is supporting us and, and you as well. So go ahead, John, I'll just say your name when I need it move. So go ahead, John. Um, I wanna start with demographics. It's really important to understand where and how we're working with students. Um, most of you don't know, and I'm not gonna go too deep in the weeds here, but the ADA had a new rule that, that came together in 2008. Uh, that amended the, the that amended the law to allow more students receive support in elementary through high school and into college. So if you can go back to your son or daughter when they were uh, seven or eight years old, even younger, some of them may have been already may have already been put in a 504 plan. When before that, they probably never would have seen a 504 plan, and you've probably seen that they've been successful through it, and that would continue on. So as you see. Um, from 2017 uh, through, uh, we have 317 who are receiving accommodations. Uh, and that also includes the 88 who are receiving a combination of academic and residential life, including uh, parking and dining and, and, and things like that. Most of our students are receiving academic accommodations. And then I broke it down again to find out what, uh, where our typical students lie to disclose to us. Uh, as you see, 77 and 59 with the ADHD LD and anxiety and depression are, are really our, our, our top students who come here. What's also important to know is the reason that OSA is located within the academic side of the house within the learning commons is if we go back to what Katie and Tracy was saying about learning new strategies, time management, organization, uh, those executive functioning skills that a lot of students who need help with have to go to a gym to relearn it. And in the case of the students that I represent, that is very difficult to switch gears and to think that you could do it on a dime. You can't. I don't know about you, but if I was to go to the gym now, I'm certainly going to take me a lot longer to get back to where I was in shape the way that I was when I needed to be there. So throughout this ish, throughout us working with your student, we're really hand in hand with not only Kate and Tracy's team and John's team, but also with academics, including professors, uh, chairs, and deans and associate deans. Uh, so keep that in mind, please. John, go ahead. Did I miss a slide? I think I, I think you skipped two. Go back one. Huh. All right. Well, anyways, go to the next one. I can make that one up as we go. 
Are you looking for uh, your numbers of requests? Yes. You had sent that in a note, but if you want, I can read them off for you. I have them. No, that's okay. Uh, so what what is important, and you can go to the next slide. I'm... Yeah, there you go. So the thing that I wanted to, to note about the numbers is since 2017, we've had a yearly increase of disclosures of 30%. So every year we're expecting 30% more students to be disclosing disabilities who are then going to be working with the, the uh, staff of the Learning Commons, who will then will also be re re receiving accommodations in the classroom. So what this says to us is, and thanks to students who are getting the outreach from Catherine's team and John's team is they're saying, gee, you know, I maybe I should disclose this. And there, more students are now coming to see us, thus more disclosures. What we realized is, what I'm realizing is that there's, there's, there's no, no way our program is sustainable with the number of students that are coming through our office. However, the silver lining is, and I wrote this too, is that COVID-19 has prepared us to adapt to all accommodations for all learners, including those with disabilities. Um, I mean, if you look at academics like an accessible bathroom, everybody can use that bathroom. The goal and the purpose now is to use these lessons of COVID throughout the past months and start to approach the administration in a different way to support accommodations in, in the classroom. So by doing so, we're, we, um, I'm co-chairing of the, I, I co-chair the Accessibility Advisory Committee, which includes uh, deans, uh, program chairs, and, uh, and uh, like-minded people throughout the university and with a big input with IT. Um, we're also a committee member, Yvonne's on our equity and inclusion uh, subcommittee, which uh, is bringing the, uh, the equity and inclusion with the eye towards also those with disabilities who may be within those certain uh, communities that are not represented. Um, and what finally we're really pushing is the universal design for learning. And, and that really entails um, a way to look at flexible options to get to the, to the information that is being required for the essential learning outcomes of the class. What we're trying to get away from as much as possible, and it's not gonna happen in every situation, is to sit in front of a classroom, watch a PowerPoint, and then have a true or false multiple choice exam at the end of it. That's not really learning in, in our opinion, but to change that dynamic is going to take a real group effort and early, um, early adopters into a universal design for, for learning uh, course. Ultimately, the goal would be that we would be limiting our types of accommodations with students because we won't need to do so, but rather we would be working as a consultant for universal des design within the classroom, within the program, within uh, everything that is involved in the university, which then gets trailed back to the academic advisory committee, who will then be the lead charge to support your students in, in a wholesome, in a whole matter. Uh, currently though, if we, if we look at our students, the way we are working now, what happens is um, Yvonne and Allie are meeting um, usually week one through four. They're doing about 12 um, individual uh, meetings with students per day. Uh, and by week eight, we go down to about eight students per week per day. Um, after midterms, we go back up again. And it, it seems to align too with uh, the learning commons groups, the types of peer tutoring and the other in the catalysts, as well as uh, Katie's team. Uh, John's team. So we walk across the hall in regular times, or now we Zoom each other uh, to make sure that your students are um, know what they have to do to get there. And if they fail the first time, they can always come back to one of us to re-engage. Uh, lastly, I, I also am the the, um, the member of the care team, which I'm sure you've heard about uh, uh, for the Learning Commons. So I go to weekly meetings, and if students are popping up there, I share that information with, with uh, the Learning Commons team so that we can get eyes on if it's an academic issue or if it's something that, the, that our group knows. So, um, you know, when you, when, you're, when you ask your, your son or daughter, hey, how are things? And they say, oh, everything's fine. Um, we probably know a lot more that's going on. So um, in my case, I can't talk for, for John's group or Trace's group, but if you have any concern, pick up the phone, email us, let me know what's going on, and then we can we can see what, what permissions we have and give you the best stories, the best update that we have in, in, in that terms. Johnny can move forward. So, so this is our group. Most importantly, I think on this slide is uh, Yvonne Sanders and Ali Theodore. 
If you look underneath their names, you'll see what d departments they support. Yvonne, as the coordinator of, of, of the health science, nursing, and education, she will be working with your student from first year all the way through, in some cases, the seventh year in the PhD program. Allie, the same thing. Uh, she'll be working as the three plus one or all the way through um, a, a law degree or a, 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 a whatever they do if they stay at Quinnipiac. Kate is our associate director. Her purpose and role is to start that consultancy model where she's training and developing guides for faculty, administration, and staff on everything universal des design. And, um, you know, today I guess I'm wearing a hockey jersey. So that's what I'm doing today is wishing we were, we were, uh, we were playing hockey. Robin, who didn't make the cut on this list, you can always call her at 7600. Uh, she is our conduit along with our student employees, which we have trained to do advocacy and support for your, your, your son or daughter, uh, primarily because as a, as a parent, I can tell my daughter and my son 101 things and they'll think it's stupid, but if a, if a friend of theirs say the same thing, it's gospel. So. Uh, we use our student workers and train them to the best of our ability so that they can get the right information so that uh, the stress and anxiety is, is as limited as possible. Okay, John, I'm done. Very good. Thanks, Matt. So one of the things I wanted to put up on the screen is, again, if we were in, not that I lose my screen. Not sir. There we go. If we were if we were back in our office and you were visiting us and having a cup of coffee and some cookies and things like that, and you have questions about your very individual student, which are often very personal and very private, we'd be able to pull you into a side office. Um, what I wanted to do is make sure that you had our contact information so that if you do want to have those conversations, we can do so. Um, Um, we can have that. With that being said, like there are a couple of questions that I want to pose to some of our people, our folks here. And if I keep darting my eyes over, it's because there is a woodpecker that has been eating my house and he's mocking me from the window behind the computer right now because he knows I can't do anything. <laughs> so, um, Katie, from the academic coach and the academic specialist position, um, one of the things I want to ask you is when a student walks in, and again, we always talk about the hardest part is getting a student to walk in your virtual door or walk into our office and sit down with you, pick up the phone and call you. What does that, what does that meeting go like? What does that initial meeting even look like? Awesome question. So one of the really cool things that happened this year, I should have added this to my slide, but I'll tell you all now, um, our coaches became certified appreciative advisors. And so we went through this really awesome program where we were able to learn even more about this appreciative advising model, um, which really just means we're getting to know your student. And so when your student walks in our door, the first thing we do is start by getting to know them. And so we wanna know who they are, where are they coming to us from, what led them to Quinnipiac? So a lot of times I'll work with a first year student. Um, that's my first question, I'm like, what? so what are you doing here, right? So why are you in the program that you're in and what do you wanna do? We ask them about their goals for the future because if we can start to break down that barrier and see, all right, what are you, what are you here for? we can have a lot more uh, go into that conversation because as we talk about their goals and as we talk about expectations, academic expectations, when we start to uncover why they wanna be here and what's their why, we can do a lot more with that student because when they say, well, this class is really challenging or I'm, I may be feeling like I'm putting in all this time into this course, we have a lot more to say, okay, well, how's that gonna to contribute to this future that you want? So we talk about experience and then we ask about challenges they might be facing. So you're in your first year, you're in your second year, maybe you're coming to see John, you're coming to see a specialist. Well, what's going on? Is there a challenge specifically that they wanna talk about? Is there an experience that they wanna share with us? Um, and then we work on to, we move on to working to develop a plan to take on challenges. And this looks different for every student. And I think that's the key point to drive home here is I have never had two meetings that look the same. And that's, I think what makes our work so important is it's so highly individualized and it's so specialized to each student in their experiences. And so we listen to your students and if they say, hey, listen, in the past I tried to use a planner and that didn't work for me, we believe them. And we listen to say, okay, so what can we do differently instead? If this hasn't worked for you in the past, how can we take on your challenges to find solutions that are gonna work specifically for you? Um, and so it looks a lot different for every student. It looks like for all of them though, encouraging them to use different plans and encouraging them to connect with resources and sticking to the plan that we're helping them create. Yeah, I mean, to, to give some perspective from working with some of the upper class students, um, again, and we have students who are first year students, we have students who are at the end of medical school who come in 
to do these academic consultations and sit down um, because everybody gets to the point right where they're the way they always were successful in school they there's a new challenge there's a new course there's a new variable in their life where they just need to come up with some new strategies um, the way I always kind of describe it to especially some of upper class students is you could go online and you could google how to study you know organic chemistry and there'll probably be some you know quick tools things like that but really what we try to do is find out well, what are you doing what has worked well for you what are those toolkits that you're currently using can we make it more effective more efficient and I like what you're talking about that breaking down the barrier and finding out the programs that they're in you know a lot of times with the upper class when we try to latch on like well how do you learn you know in everyday experience so for example if I'm working with a nursing student you know and I'm trying to talk about like preparation before a class discussion a lot of times we'll talk about all right if I'm your patient what do you do before you come see me you read my chart you you prepare for that meeting so that way it's a discussion it's not you trying to learn everything out on the fly right so yeah you're right you're absolutely right about how it's those those individualized discussions versus here here's a brochure here's some study tips take these and go right um matt one of the questions that we have is you know, I know finals weeks are, you know, it's coming up in about a month. Um, it's a little different this year in terms of like where students will be. Can you give us some insight in terms of what finals look like for students who may have testing accommodations? What are some of the things you're planning and your team's working on? So if this was typical finals this year, we would be administering over 2000 exams that would be located within the learning commons as well as an adjunct area of the university, which we would proctor. Uh, since going online in the in the QFlex model, we have gone down to about proctoring 15 tests per week. Uh, we've done a full training model for all university uh, professors on how to support extra time on tests, as well as how to proctor online via Zoom to continue with the uh, reduced distraction. We do have a process in place where if students cannot find a room, we will show them how to find the room. If they can't find one and it's too filled up, then we'll make alternative, uh, we'll find an alternative place for them to take an exam, including there in the learning commons. In order for that to take place though, they have to talk with Ali and Yvonne and they can schedule, your students can schedule meetings with Ali and Yvonne if that's the case. We have particular situations in which students with accommodations can only take a paper exam. We have also set up a system that allows professors to proctor those exams, but we could also do that as well. And that system has also been approved through academic integrity. We expect bumps in the road, but the bumps have become a lot smoother since we rolled this out back in April. And as well as the students and, and the professors who feel more comfortable with it. Uh, again, if there's ever a concern, just pick up the phone, email Ali or Yvonne, and as a team, we will approach it to make sure that your, your student is accommodated correctly for testing. Matt, going along with that, as we get ready for, you know, the turn of the semester, head into J-term in spring, is there anything students need to do for your shop to prepare for spring courses? Are there, is there anything they should expect to be different from fall to spring? I, I, would, I would expect, without a crystal ball, that we're going to be continuing in QFlex. Uh, what I would say is they're going to have to, like every student, every semester, has to come back to our office and request their accommodations. We're, we're not asking any students to update any medical documentation at this point on a case by case basis, depending on the situation. So again, if you're looking to get the same accommodations that they had last semester, fine, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna work that out. Uh, they have new classes, new teachers, everything's new. We also wanna go over the last semester to see what worked and what didn't and would additional accommodations be required or would we need to refer back to Learning Commons staff so that uh, we can continue to support the, um, the academic gym. Uh, so the key here is that the takeaway is um, expect the QFlex, uh, have, the, have, your, have your son or daughter meet with one of us and get the accommodations in place for the spring uh, sooner, than, sooner than later. Typically, since we're gonna be home uh, I know Ali and Yvonne send out emails, read receipt to remind um, your students to schedule an appointment with them. So all you have to do is, is, is ask them, hey, did you get that email from Yvonne or, or, or Ali? And if they said no, just let me know and we'll, we'll make sure that, that we get it to them. Thanks, Matt. Yep. 
Tracy, one of the things that I know I hear all the time from students, um, and Katie, you might hear this a lot as well, students who haven't started to use peer education resources. So for example, they haven't gone to study tables yet, but in their mind, like they know it's a resource, they know it's a good thing, but there's a barrier. They, they're worried that, you know, I, I feel like I don't know enough to even go in front of one of my peers and ask for help. And I'm nervous about coming out and saying like, I don't understand or I'm behind. Right. I know you work with students who are going through that all the time. Can you give some advice? Oh, absolutely. Want to get involved and want to start using resources now? Sure. Yeah, so I think two things I would say is that, um, is that, you know, we have, we've set up a safe place for students to make mistakes in the peer education programs and that students would be surprised how often their question or their difficulty is shared by other students, you know, and then um, really how grateful other students are to hear that question. <laughs> so, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions or to show that you haven't completely mastered, you know, a certain part of, of your learning in a subject because that's what we're here for. Um, so that's the first thing, you know, and related is that there's really no stigma. I mean, when I say stigma, it's kind of a fraught word, you know, that um, there's some theory that first year students and, uh, you know, and students who are having difficulty might feel stigmatized by going for help, you know, that it's not good to show how behind you are in a class. And that's just not true at all. You know, we, um, our students who come for help range from the A student who just wants to turn the, or the, the A range students who, who just wants to turn an A minus into an A, you know, to the student who's really struggling and needs just, needs a little bit of assistance in order to gain skills to pass the class, you know, so we have a wide range. Um, there's no stigma in coming to ask for help, you know. Third of all, if the student, if the student's just completely lost, oh my gosh, I have no idea what happened in those first two lectures. Um, the best thing to do, you know, is taking notes, just star or check places in your notes where you know that you were lost. Students really think that they should 100% understand the notes as the, as the professor delivers them. And that is not how optimum learning works. You know, our peer educators had parts of the lecture where they, where, you know, where they genuinely struggled, uh, but the difference is that they marked those places, went back and chased them down and resolved those questions, often with a peer educator. You know, so students shouldn't feel that everybody else in this class is a genius because nobody's asking questions and I'm the only one who's confused during these difficult, you know, this difficult lecture. That is not the case. Just mark the spots where you were confused. Um, go back and chase them down in your textbook and with a peer educator if needed. Um, so that's, that's my advice. Is there any muted. Is there any other question that you need? Yes, sorry, sorry, Tracy. Okay. So no I know a lot of times students will ask us, you know, I really do want to go to my peer fellow review session, but it's being held on a night that I work or that, you know, I'm not on campus and I can't be there. Um, sure. Are students allowed to go to a different peer fellow set review session? Do you know these people are going to be in? Yes. There? No, I don't yes. think so. It's covered it just in case. No. Absolutely, they are. Um, basically, you know, in, in, for instance, our STEM co courses, bio, uh, chemistry, math, bio 101 in particular, you know, which pertains to freshmen, um, first year students, uh, chem 110 or chem 101, and um, math in all of the, you know, 100s, uh, the 100 number classes, uh, 100 through 153. Um, there are multiple professors, or excuse me, a, a professor will teach multiple sections, which means that that student might very well have more than one peer fellow supporting that one professor. You know, so the student will have options in that case to go to a different peer fellow session. But with Zoom, we are able to record the peer fellow sessions and we're able to send those recorded sessions, the link to them, to students who've missed the sessions, along with a worksheet. 
You know, so a student who absolutely can't attend, um, you know, is the sole peer fellow for one professor uh, has the option to play back that session along with getting the worksheet. Um, but along with that, I strongly urge the students not to skip the recorded session, you know, not to just go to the worksheet and think the worksheet is all they need because the two things, the session as well as the worksheet, go together to reinforce learning. You're going to, you're going to skip out on some learning if you think the worksheet is all that you need. Yeah, I think that you're definitely right about those, the actual Socratic discussion that's going on in those sessions because what I keep hearing about is students are asking questions, but the peer fellows are also paying attention to what is not being asked that should be. Um, you know, no one seems to be asking these questions, but you know, hey guys, like I've been here before, I've done this, yeah. like this is important. We kind of and, provide that guidance. And I'd also like to add that, you know, the, the, besides the content knowledge, the other very important piece, and this will reinforce what, you know, Katie's group is doing, um, the other things that the peer fellows know are the study strategies that work for that particular class. You know, so a student might be mired in a textbook and kind of far afield from what the professor is prioritizing, but if a peer fellow will know, uh, no, 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 go to the PowerPoint first in a biology lecture, um, use the, you know, um, study the key terms in the PowerPoint and then use the textbook for reinforcement. Um, a student might not know that strategy, might not know that that strategy really works well, um, as opposed to a much less efficient strategy like pouring through the textbook chapter um, and looking at tons and tons of details that are not covered in the um, PowerPoint lecture. Mm -hmm. um, Katie, question for you is like, students deciding, all right, I want to start meeting with my academic coach. I want to meet with my academic specialist, but I didn't pay attention. I don't know who that is, <laughs> right? How do they find that out? Easy. So if they, go, well, first of all, if they search their email, I can promise you they've heard from us. So I'm sure they would not have to scroll far to see an email from either their specialist or their coach trying to check in, trying to say hello. The other piece of that is they can now use our Thrive for Students. So I touched on this a little bit earlier, but either using MyQ or the Quinnipiac mobile app, they can log in. And once they log in and they select, select an appointment, um, their coach's schedule will automatically pop up. So they won't have the option to click a coach. They'll just see, for example, my students, it would just be Katie's calendar. And then they can su suggest or select a time they'd like to meet with me. Um, and it'll automatically pop in on my calendar. So it's a really cool system. Um, I think it's worked very well this semester. My schedule fills up really quickly because they can see when I'm free, which is awesome. But the other piece of that, and I drill this home to students all the time is, and I think it goes along with what Matt was saying earlier, this concept of the academic gym is we don't only want to hear from students when they feel they need to meet with us, right? And so I encourage my students regularly, if you don't need to have a meeting, maybe it's just good news, maybe you just want to check in, you can also always email your specialist or coach. So say we were working on the bio exam. I know all of us have talked a lot about bio. I'm sure you can tell where our heads are at. And you do really, really well on the second exam and you're really proud of your hard work. I love getting that email. I got one the other day, a student said, hey, I just crushed exam three, I did really, really well. And they were super excited and they were telling me what strategies they used and why they thought they worked. We wanna hear that good news just as much. And so I always say to students, email me. If it's not a check-in, if it's not a meeting you need to have, but you still wanna get connected, always feel free to email your coach or specialist too. Very good. And then Matt, on the other end, you know, we want students to disclose, like if student feels they need to disclose, they have learning disability, they need some sort of accommodation. Um, what would you say to the student who's a little nervous? Like they don't want to be labeled. You know, they, they feel like a little bit nervous about coming forward and be like, hey, I kind of need some help. How does, your, how does your office usually respond to that? Well, what, the way we usually respond is uh, simply working as a team with, with uh, the learning commons is to recognize that the accommodation is not really, typically is ne really is never the issue. It's once you have that accommodation, what are you doing to learn new strategies to learn that information? If it's metacognition, if it's management, organization, if it's content, whatever's not working isn't because you need an accommodation. Rather, it's because you're not looking and attacking the information the way it needs to be done. 
And that's why it's important to A, make sure you get the extra time and the reduced distraction or whatever other accommodation you may need that's reasonable. So that way you're also protected under the ADA and uh, your faculty will be made aware behind the scenes confidentially that you require these accommodations. And then up front, we, we make sure that they are the students connected with whatever resource that the Learning Commons needs. And now they have a team that that, that student is now running. Uh, some students like that idea, others, they're a little more stubborn and it might take them a few um, prodding and to, to, get, to get the student to recognize that they've had this all along, they might as well get the accommodation and move forward with their lives. And uh, we see that uh, unfortunately more so than, than we'd like to admit. Very good. Um, yeah, I'd say one of, the, one of the big things we try to tell students all the time, especially from day one when they come on campus as a new student, a first year student, a grad student, a transfer, is you know, come to the Learning Commons, just walk in the door. Even if you don't, you know, sometimes we have students say like, hey, I know I'm supposed to be utilizing you guys as a resource. I don't really know how it fits into my world. That's okay. We will, we will give you examples. We will look at kind of like what is going on in your life. Is it classes? Is it clinicals? Is it field work? What do you have going on? And kind of help guide your students and say, here's how you can build in some resources, not extra work, just smarter work, right? Like you're going to be working on, you know, you're gonna be writing every week anyway. You might as well sit down with a writing tutor, you know, and kind of work that into your schedule. Or if you're going to be studying for chemistry, you might as well build in those review sessions that are naturally just structured with other people who are also working on the same content. Um, you know, if you're a student going into a, you know, what you believe to be a challenging semester, go sit down with your academic specialist and kind of talk over, all right, here's how I've typically gone about learning and how I've gone about structuring my academic life. Here are the classes I'm taking. Is there any advice? Is there anything you've, you know, we'll, we'll talk to students about here's what we typically see. Here's what, you know, the questions that typically come up and really try to build it in so it's a personalized experience. Um, that being said, uh, I'd like to thank everybody who joined me today. And really, uh, if you have questions about your individual student, please send us an email. Um, all right, we are happy, happy to connect with you. Um, and Miriam, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, well, thank you to all the parents who joined us today and thank you to our presenters. As you can see and you heard today, the Learning Commons offers a wide variety of services to support your student, help them succeed. As Tracy mentioned today, it's not just the student who's struggling, it might be the student that wants to go from a B to an A. So we really encourage you to have your student reach out and um, contact the Learning Commons. Um, so thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying your Parents and Family Weekend virtually this year and um, hope to see you on campus at some point soon. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.